malice. But what motive? The FBI says this man went to the Los Angeles airport intent to kill. Now they're looking into his background to find out why. Disaster in southern Texas. More rain, rising waters, entire lives literally washed away. Human clones, still the stuff of science fiction? He says he's already made one. And the death of an American icon, Ted Williams, one of the greatest baseball players of all time. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Good evening. Dan is off tonight. I'm John Roberts. We're learning more tonight about the Arab gunman behind the deadly 4th of July shooting at the El Al ticket counter at Los Angeles International Airport. But there is still a lot investigators don't know. Did he have any terrorist connections? And if not, what was his motive? The search for answers began in the gunman's home, as CBS News correspondent Bill Whitaker reports. The FBI identified this man, Egyptian immigrant Hashem Mohammed Hadayat, as the gunman who went on the murderous Independence Day rampage at Los Angeles International Airport. The 41-year-old limousine driver was armed with a hunting knife and two handguns, one a semi-automatic pistol, when he shot to death a man and a woman at the El Al ticket counter, and a security guard shot and killed him. Besides terrorism and such, we're also looking at the possibility of a hate crime, uh, we're also looking in the possibility of uh, the person being despondent for some reason. Overnight, agents scoured Hadayat's suburban Los Angeles apartment, retrieving a computer, searching for a motive. Some neighbors described a quiet family man, others an angry man, especially after 9-11. His upstairs neighbor unfurled flags above Hadayat's door. He had a lot of anger. He had a lot of anger at America. He said a lot of the crazy people in America get a lot of anger. In Egypt, where his wife and two sons are spending the summer, Hadayat's uncle says the news from America is hard to believe. I don't feel that he do that. But the FBI says he did, that he stood quietly in line and with no provocation opened fire. He was wrestled to the ground by a man in line and an El Al security guard, all the while slashing with his knife, then was shot dead by a second security guard. Waiting passenger Paul Parkas shot this picture. Thank God El Al security took him down or it would have been, who knows, because I mean, everybody, everybody was just laying out on the ground. He could have just sat there and shot away at people. But he had enough time to kill two. El Al employee Vicky Hen and Yaakov Aminov, an Israeli immigrant, at the airport to drop off a friend. And he's very sad. <laughs> we lost my brother long. He's a very good person. He never hurt nobody. <laughs> now, this international terminal is back to normal now. But this whole incident has sparked new debate about even more airport security. Los Angeles is considering a new plan to check all bags and check all passengers before they even enter the airport grounds. John? Bill Whitaker reporting for us tonight from the Bradley Terminal at LAX. Bill, thanks. The Israelis have long been world leaders in air travel security. We asked CBS News Middle East correspondent David Hawkins to show you how they do it. At Israel's Ben-Gurion Airport, the security checks start at the door, the car door. Armed guards look over every vehicle entering the airport. At each step of the way, you're being watched by uniformed security personnel and maybe that guy over there. Armed agents mix in with the crowd. All that before anyone asks you whether you packed your own luggage or tells you to open it for inspection, and before you get anywhere near the ticket desk. El Al, Israel's national airline, has its own security officers, like the one who stopped yesterday's attack in Los Angeles. They're rigorously trained for seven months by Israel's equivalent of the FBI, the Shin Bet. El Al spares no effort and no expense at maintaining its reputation as the world's most security-conscious airline. I think that if such a case would have happened here in Israel, we could deal it in a better way. Because uh, we have additional measures which are not adopted worldwide. Some of those measures are obvious, like the unapologetic use of passenger profiling. Others are closely guarded secrets. The security may be tighter, but there's less to secure. Ben-Gurion Airport has only two terminals and handles about 17,000 passengers a day. The Los Angeles airport handles 10 times as many. 
Adopting Israeli security standards for American airports and airlines carries a sky-high price tag and still might not stop someone from sneaking a gun into an airport terminal. Could it happen here? An Israeli airport official says probably. It's just not as likely. You get what you pay for. David Hawkins, CBS News, Ben Gurion Airport, Israel. In this country, it appears the road to economic recovery is going to be a long one. Unemployment edged up in June to 5.9 percent. In the past three months, the economy has created just 39,000 jobs. On a brighter note, though, a big advance on Wall Street today. They traded just half the day, but the Dow posted its 10th biggest point gain ever. It was a relatively trouble-free 4th of July that lit a fire under Wall Street. The Dow shook off a pre-Independence Day swoon and shot up 324 points. Even the anemic Nasdaq found new life, gaining almost 70 points, finishing the week above its post-9-11 low. People were actually afraid of a terrorist attack. The stock market was. And when there was none, we had a nice relief rally. The good news that there was no significant bad news even helped Wall Street shrug off a slight rise in the June unemployment rate. A tenth of a percent is not a big deal at all. And the fact is that the unemployment rate is still very low relative to history. But the biggest jump in the Dow since last September doesn't mean the slide is over. Investor confidence is still shattered in the wake of the world common Enron scandals. And most people believe there's more to come. There'll be other things down the pike. I'm, I'm almost sure of it. It's got to be cleaned up. It's in the process of being cleaned up, and it will be cleaned up, and then we'll be able to go forward. President Bush will attempt to restore some of that investor confidence in an address to Wall Street on Tuesday, but the street is already urging Mr. Bush not to propose any new regulations, just enforce existing laws. On the weather watch tonight, rising water in south central Texas. After storms dumped as much as two and a half feet of rain this week, the Weather Service is calling it a flood catastrophe. Thousands of people have been flooded out around San Antonio with rushing waters from bloated rivers swept away entire homes. Mark Strassman is in the flood zone tonight. Never before now have floodwaters surged over the Canyon Dam north of San Antonio and swallowed parts of South Central Texas. So much water, so much power, so much fear. This is home video of a house that became just more debris floating down the Guadalupe River. I've been through the 52, the 72, and the 98 flood and have never seen anything that would come close to comparing with what I saw today. All this misery follows 30 inches of rain just since Monday. I mean, it's just mind-boggling just to watch this much water. Buster Barnett woke up to watch disaster rise around him. By mid-morning, his dry home that was by the river was in the river. You look at it, but you don't believe it, what you're seeing. I mean, just the force of the water. The Guadalupe River churns 30 feet above flood stage. It is hauling. It's going so fast. People here were hauling, too. We're taking everything. In Castroville, due west of San Antonio, authorities ordered 4,000 people to leave. Beverly Chuvling was grateful to be rescued and feel dry land again. The river's just been coming up. We've been here for a long time and it's never done this before. Seven people have died since the flooding began, including Diane Cardenas' parents. I said, you have no business being out in this weather, Dad. Robert and Carmen Sanchez disappeared Monday while running errands. Emergency crews finally found their bodies inside their submerged car. I knew, I knew they were in the water. But it hurts just as for that floating house, it stopped here after colliding with another one, all right in Buster Barnett's disappearing neighborhood, where everything but the kitchen sink has drifted past. Price you pay for living by the river. That price tag for Texas keeps rising with the water. Tens of millions of dollars in damage already. Ten Texas counties declared federal disaster areas, and a weekend forecast that calls for more rain. John. Mark Strassman, knee-deep in the misery in New Braunfels, Texas. Mark, thanks. Ted Williams, the Hall of Fame baseball player who wrote the book on hitting, died today from a heart attack in Florida. The splendid splinter was 83 years old. Jim Axelrod has more on the life and career of the All-Stars All-Star. Without Ted Williams, baseball's record book would be pages thinner. Six-time batting champion, four-time home run champ, twice a triple crown winner, and the last man to hit 400. Chad has himself a 
double. When he said, I want to be remembered as the greatest hitter that ever lived, he probably was. Like some kind of baseball wizard, he claimed he could see the seams on a pitch as it spun, smell the wood burn as a bat hit a ball. William swing, and there's a long drive to deep right. A wizard who magically homered in his last at bat for the Boston Red Sox. Congratulations to Ted Williams. And turned grown men into little boys. This was the All-Star game three years ago. He was mobbed. And when he came out in the field and everybody just kind of gathered around him, I mean, I think it just showed the appreciation of every single player, you know, past and present that we had for him. For those players that night and several generations more, the appreciation was for Williams' drive to be the best. The only thing that stimulated me was when somebody was, that I was playing against was doing a better job than I was doing. Williams' life reminds us all how much things have changed in this country. Already a huge star, he interrupted his career to serve as a fighter pilot. Not once, twice. World War II and Korea. Those five prime years may have cost him Babe Ruth's home run record, but that's just the way it was back then. And this is the end of the golden age of baseball. He's the last. That era is passed with the passing of Ted Williams. Ted Williams didn't always get along with fans and reporters. At times, he seemed more consumed by fishing. But as they lower the flag to half-staff at Fenway Park and mow Teddy Ball Games number nine into the outfield grass, baseball knows it lost a legend, the splendid splinter. Even this powerful wizard couldn't stop time. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, New York. Next up on the Friday edition of the CBS Evening News, human cloning. It could be a lot closer to reality than you may realize. When Congress returns from its holiday recess, one major piece of legislation still pending will be a ban on all human cloning. But the proposed law already lags well behind what may be scientifically possible. And in tonight's Eye on America, Wyatt Andrews reports the cloning debate gets even cloudier when the issue is human cloning to treat disease. If you think human clones are some far-off fantasy, then meet Michael West, the scientist who says his lab, Advanced Cell Technology, has made a human clone already. It's a whole new area of medicine. It's very powerful. The clone of an anonymous donor grew to six cells before it stopped growing last November. What exactly did you do or make that day? What we did is a very simple thing. We put a human body cell into a human egg cell. While some scientists doubt this claim, West's announcement of a human clone drew attention to a well-kept secret. Most of the nation's top research scientists favor what's called therapeutic cloning. That is, human clones produced in the lab, not to make a baby, but to make embryonic stem cells. Do you think that most Americans haven't focused on this as medicine? I think that's right. We're thinking about cloning Hitler's and Mussolini's instead of cloning cells. We're thinking about curing life-threatening diseases, not cloning people. To West, therapeutic cloning is the answer to a list of diseases. Alzheimer's disease, autism. Because he says, with cloning, all medicine in the future will be personal. The idea is, one day, if you get sick, doctors will be able to clone you. They'll use your stem cells to grow whatever tissue you need, be it brain cells or a whole organ, and then, because that tissue is you, it won't be rejected. I think it, the ramifications of therapeutic cloning could be huge. Dr. John Gerhardt of Johns Hopkins is one of the scientists asking Congress to permit cloning for research. The basic argument is that for the first 14 days, a lab dish clone is not a human life, it's just a clump of cells. You cannot safely make a human being from that. I would say the cells are alive, but I do not believe that it is a human being. What species if it, is it is, if it isn't a human being? David Prentice, a cell biologist, calls the distinction between cells and life biologically fuzzy. He believes clones are people from cell one. Scientifically, it's a human being, a human embryo. The real question that comes up is now, is it a person or a piece of property? This is a war against disease. Michael West says cloning for research is an unstoppable reality that will happen this year, driven by the speculative promise that cloning is the future of medicine. In Worcester, Massachusetts, Wyatt Andrews for Eye on America.
After the third round of talks this year, the United Nations and Iraq failed again today to reach an agreement on resuming arms inspections. They said more meetings will be held. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and the Iraqi Foreign Minister talked for two days but couldn't agree on terms that would allow arms inspectors back into Iraq. They left in December of 1998 and their return to look for nuclear, chemical and biological weapons is a key condition for lifting UN economic sanctions. South Africa's highest court ruled today public hospitals must provide an anti-AIDS drug to pregnant women infected with HIV. Studies show the drug can reduce transmission of HIV from mother to baby by up to half. There are more people infected with the virus that causes AIDS in South Africa than any other country. And what could be one of Germany's last Nazi war crimes trial came to an end today. Former SS Major Friedrich Engel, the so-called Butcher of Genoa, was convicted in the massacre of hundreds of Italian prisoners. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, but because of his age, Engel is 93, he will not serve the time. Now take a look at this. It's really rather amazing. These folks in England are making their way through a field, but not just any field. It's a maze made of maize, or corn if you prefer. It's the largest maze of its kind in the world, 16 acres in all. It was created with the help of a global positioning satellite. It took three years and a lot of ears. You're watching the CBS Evening News, and up next, America's last cold warriors, ready and waiting, in the DMZ. North Korea admitted today that some of its sailors were killed in last week's naval clash that left four South Koreans dead and inflamed tensions on the peninsula. The incident also prompted the United States to shelve an offer to resume talks with the North next week. U.S. troops, who are South Korea's first line of defense against the North, are more alert than ever. As CBS's Barry Peterson reports on assignment in the DMZ. In America's global war on terrorism, Red one, this is Red Eagle. they prepare for a war few at home think about against the world's last Cold War regime. I know the people here understand why we're here, and I hope the people back home can understand. I mean. Korea might be the forgotten war, but it's not a forgotten place. This is the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, where 37,000 U.S. soldiers are literally on the line. If there is an invasion from the North, they will be the first to defend, the first to die. Out there, on the North Korean side of the DMZ, they have so much artillery already in place they could launch a half million rounds in the first hour, some of them hitting as far south as Seoul. The U.S. military estimates in the first few days there would be a million casualties. That would be a far different kind of war than back in 1950. Americans fought in the mud and snow after the North invaded, later reinforced by the Chinese. Over the next three years, more than 33,000 Americans would die here. More than 100,000 would come home wounded in what came to be known as the Forgotten War, but not forgotten by those on the peninsula today, like Army Sergeant Brian Faber. For me, it's patriotism and just basically paying uh, an unknown debt to, uh, to the guys that lost their lives. Lock and load. These men walk the Cold War's last front line. They patrol inside the DMZ with North Korean soldiers patrolling the same area on their side. Roger, you go up. Some Americans in the war on terrorism shoot to kill. Here, victory comes if there is no shooting, if the enemy is simply afraid to cross the line. On assignment at the DMZ, I'm Barry Peterson. We will end the week on these musical notes. At a music store in Birmingham, Alabama, they put together the world's largest piano ensemble, 121 piano players, using their 1,210 fingers to play patriotic tunes. Now they have their fingers crossed, hoping that their group effort will be recognized. They don't want a big record contract. The high note they seek is recognition in the Guinness Book of World Records. And that's the CBS Evening News for this Friday. Dan Rather will be along later on tonight with 48 Hours. Richard Schlesinger as a preview.
How would you like a family reunion every day of the year? Like the Jacksons, the Jackson 20. How do you organize this house? We could have given uh, tips to Eisenhower on planning D-Day, you know. Tonight on 48 Hours. 48 Hours at a special time tonight, 8, 7 Central. For Dan Rather, I'm John Roberts. We leave you now with the New York celebration of America's birthday. Good night. Thanks for watching. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. AOL keyword CBS News.